Hi, and welcome back to The History Hut. I'm Jim. This is Dr. Kane. We're, we're talking about First Nations people. We're talking about all the trouble that, that was uh, happening in the area. Uh, so what's the government's response? Well, the government's response to the Cypress Hills Massacre is, yeah, we've got to get out there. We've got to get this place settled down. We don't want any Indian wars. We, we don't really have an army, so we have nobody to send <laughs> out there. So we've got to do something. We don't want a lawless frontier. So Seems fair, yeah. John A. Macdonald decides to create a, a paramilitary force and it's modelled, I think, on the Irish police force um, to protect the Northwest. And so it becomes the Northwest Mounted Police or the Mounties, as <laughs> we know and love them to this very day. Um, and so they were to be, so it creates a Northwest Mounted Police Force that's to be sent out West to patrol the West and to keep it dry to make sure there's no alcohol in that territory at all on pain of fines or maybe jail time. Uh, and of course, to keep the bad guys out. Right? Mm -hmm. So you want to get to whip up country as, <laughs> as soon as you possibly can. So of course, they have to travel all the way across Canada to get out to the West. And this is called the Great March. And uh, in 1999, I think it was, they reenacted the, the Great March. Um, hmm. I don't know if you remember, if you were even born then. Oh, I'm sure <laughs> you were born then. I think I was, uh, yeah. they, they had people in, in uh, you know, in costume and they had their horses and stuff. And But they also had their RVs with them, you know, just so they don't have to sleep out. Great, we reenacted it <laughs> on a train. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, we reenacted it. So uh, it's all um, young, raw recruits, from, mostly from Ontario, and they travel by rail through Chicago to St. Paul, right? You know, again, we still don't have the railway at this point. Uh, then to Fargo, North Dakota. Then they walked 100 kilometers north to the Canadian border to get, you know, walked along the Red River. Uh, and then they got to Fort Dufferin, which is Emerson, Manitoba now. And they had an artist for the Canadian Illustrated News with them so he could draw lovely pictures of what they were <laughs> up to. Uh, and it's just too much for some of them. I mean, they're just young guys and they think, oh, this will be a really good job, you know, time away from home, out west. And uh, three days into the march, about 40 of them deserted. <laughs> uh, they were getting 75 cents a day, which is probably quite good, uh, but they deserted. The rest were led by uh, Lieutenant Colonel French and uh, one of his assistants, James McLeod, he of the Isle of Skye. And they were bound for uh, Fort Whoop up near Lethbridge and they had, um, you know, all their equipment with them. So, of course, they're quite, they quite move quite slowly. So they've got over 300 horses, over 140 oxen, 93 cattle for food, 114 Red River carts, those really squeaky ones, uh, 20 Métis drives. 73 wagons, it sounds like a folk song, two <laughs> nine pound field gun, guns, two and a brass partridge mortars, in a pear tree. Yeah. <laughs> mowing machines for hay, and they had field kitchens with them as well. So they don't, um, they don't do a, a lot of distance per day. Now, I can't remember, I shouldn't really say uh, what distance they do because I can't actually remember. I just remember that. Uh, I, I, when I was talking about the Mongols, I mentioned that they could go 140 miles per day, and I think the Mounties were doing like 30. And I said, <laughs> "Oh, that's so slow." And unbeknownst to me, there was a there was a plainclothes mounted Royal Canadian Mounted Policeman in my class who Ooh. took umbrage at that, and then berated me by you know telling me all the things they had to carry with them. Though not like those Mongols, all they had was their you know saddlebag and a couple of couple of uh, needles for for sewing stuff. But these guys had their mortars and all their mm. stuff with them. But anyway, they have a really rough time. Uh, there's 275 of them set off on July the 8th, and uh, 10 days later they they had gone. 240 kilometers so that's yeah not doing mm. all that fast um and then a prairie gale blew away lots of their tents and scattered their horses and they'd already run out of oats 10 days in and the horses were exhausted and the men had to walk every other hour so they have uh they have like a really really rough time as they're going across uh, by um july 24th they were about 440 kilometers west of fort dufferin but they're morale was really low and they decide that they'll split their troop and they'll send one part of it to find um, Edmonton. <laughs> I'll find Fort Edmonton, that's the big company post there and then uh, they'll they'll hook up with the rest in well, the southern part which will be Fort McLeod later on uh, in the winter. So by mid-August they have uh, they've had an outbreak of dysentery 
not nice when you're not near a bathroom. Uh, they were <laughs> pestered at night by wolves. They complained uh, about mosquitoes all the time. This is a little quote. They invaded your eyes, your mouth, your ears and got into your clothes a million at a time. Uh, they faced a grasshopper infestation, which we have had uh, on occasion in the West, and it's terrible. And then dust storms that just covered them with dirt, and they couldn't believe that there were prairie fires behind them. They were like, we're trapped, and we don't know where we're going. This is terrible. And they worried constantly about the possibility of attack by native people as well. They were like, oh, we've no idea where they are or how they'll, you know, the, how they'll mm -hmm. react to us. Um, so there's about 50 horses, and six of the men died. The horses died of hunger. And at one point, they had to eat frogs legs 150 frogs so 300 legs no more do frogs have four legs I don't what, know. what am i <laughs> <laughs> two-legged frogs in the west that's terrible so they had to eat frogs legs um and they're just overwhelmed because there's a lot a lot of uh, anecdotal accounts of this and of course a lot of accounts in the modern period you know looking back to these uh, these heady days so absolutely overwhelmed by the largeness of the the territory and by the loneliness of the landscape and they couldn't stand the silence that's when the grasshoppers had stopped rubbing mm. their little legs yeah. together i'm guessing um someone said it was a real desert a land of desolation and it will remain such until the white man settle the white man settles upon it and turns the waste into a garden oh that's <laughs> so sweet so um the monotony absolutely unbearable and at one point colonel french asked jerry potts the um, interpreter, uh, what was over the next hill? And Potts replied, "Another hill." Uh -huh. And so they they were they were only near. That, that must be two hills. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and then we've got three hills up to the north. So uh, yeah, you got to make sure you're in the right hill to the territory. <laughs> so uh, they by September they're near Medicine Hat in the south, and um, September 18th. That's 1,600 kilometers later, uh, they sighted Fort Whoop Up, and only they get there to find out that everybody's gone back to Montana. So the place is completely empty, so they don't, they, you know, it doesn't <laughs> kind of work out as well as they'd hope. But they have, yeah, there's all sorts of problems. Uh, there's a little timeline of this uh, air filled with locusts and ox dies in their heavy thunderstorms. Um, July 14th, forced march until 9 p.m., men tired and thirsty, no water, no wood, no supper. And so, um, October, about October the 13th, I think, they established Fort McLeod as their headquarters and, uh, of course, earn the respect of local chiefs because they're happy that they're there and that they'll keep, you know, all the other people out. And they use the Northwest Territorial Act to... Uh, of 1875 um, the following year to keep the place dry and it declared that the sale or possession of liquor was an offence. So alcohol continues to be the focus of them for the Mounties uh, even though um, they, you know, the the Fort Whip Up guys have all disappeared and there's a, a statistic from 1884 that 87% of their cases were still prosecutions for liquor or liquor related crimes oh. so just a huge huge problem with that and the Mounties got into trouble themselves after all they're young they're single they're male they're out on the prairies probably paying bit sexist field hockey yeah, <laughs> I don't know yeah. <laughs> some hockey sort of game uh, and so there's a, a really um, a really nice little quote here uh, a wee article called They Always Got Their Dram uh, and it's um, in 1886 H Troop at Lethbridge got its back pay and went on a prolonged collective binge that terrorised the town <laughs> at Fort McLeod two drunk Mounties held up a visitor from Saskatoon on the main street relieved him of his wallet and returned to the hotel to carry on drinking <laughs> just quite, so if people thought people were of course thinking well you know they're supposed to um, get the alcohol and, and pour it away and so uh, it says the bounties were supposed to spill the seized booze onto the ground there were dark suspicions of underground containers at their posts to capture the spills Woo! and while we're on the subject of alcohol no I'm not going to give you a beer but while we're on the subject of alcohol I just uh, remember we were talking about uh, about what the annual consumption of every man, woman, and child in uh, in Canada was. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was four gallons per man, woman, and child. And if you look at today, the statistics for this last year, um, every Canadian, if you man, woman, and child, 7.8 litres per capita for Canada. So it would have worked out in the 1890s to um, be 18. Mm. So we've actually reduced from 18 per capita to 7.8, whereas today Britain's at 11.2. And Luxembourg has the highest alcoholic consumption in the oh. entire Western world at 15.5 litres per person. So How about it's that? It's like, what, a population of 10 in Luxembourg? <laughs> and they're, all just having a, they're all just having a great time.
So anyway, that's that's the government response. Okay. Now back back to the First Nations. Uh, why did they sign treaties with the government? Okay. Well. Absolutely practical reasons. Um, there's trouble with the food supply, first of all, because of the reduction, huge reduction in the number of buffalo, now just in the thousands. There's also increases in um, inter-tribal or inter-nation warfare. Uh, the Sioux move north into Canada. Uh, the Crees start to hunt in neutral territory. The Blackfoot come into neutral territory. The Cree and the Blackfoot fight each other in neutral territory, and there's some really nasty conflicts. So there's open warfare between the Cree and Blackfoot kind of 1865 to 75 which is the same time where the disease frontier is having that terrible impact as well um, and then again the disease the the epidemics that reduce the population by maybe as much as 50 percent uh, it actually changes the the dynamics of the of the population in terms of Cree versus Blackfoot because the Cree because they were so closely tied to the Hudson Bay Company they were actually inoculated by the company and so their numbers are higher and mm -hmm. the Blackfoot numbers drop because they have less contact. Um, then there's all that instability caused by the, the whiskey traders and then of course the Cypress Hills massacre, the, the, the inability of the Canadian government to get the men really brought to justice in Canada. Um, and then, of course, on the good side, you, you have the arrival of the Northwest Mounted Police to stabilize the area and the possibility that this stability could be ongoing. Right. So all these terrible things that are going on. So life had become really unstable for uh, Plains people and they had to make some changes. Uh, they had to adapt to new situations, mainly the, the, the disappearance of the buffalo. Uh, and they hoped that making treaties with the government might help them. And the typic, the reason that you asked why they signed treaties, and I'm assuming that you're asking why they signed a treaty instead of some other kind of thing. And the reason for that seems to be that the way Native people had dealt with outsiders, whether it had been the French or later on the English or anybody else, they'd always dealt with them um, through the fur trade and through treaties. So you would have annual treaty negotiations at, the f at every fur trade sitting so you would renew you decide how much mm -hmm. something was worth and you know what kind of help you were going to give and so um, because it's especially true for the fur trade it's the normal way that that people dealt the, the, that the people dealt with outsiders so it's kind of you know it's the kind of and a problem I think a problem there is that they were used to annual treaties and when the government decides to, to use the, the form of treaty, they're thinking one of, we'll go mm -hmm. in, we'll sign something, get it done, then we won't have to worry about it again. So it's two, two different concepts, but but both find it normal to use treaty yeah. as the way of, of the way of proceeding. Well, that's quite interesting, isn't it? Oh, good, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe in, in part three, you can tell me uh, why, why the government decided to I certainly to will. I'm more than capable of doing that. <laughs> well, you can prove that <laughs> in part three of Later this episode. On.